Hello, and welcome to what must be 27 of a book or two to review. And this is one interesting one for me. This is the Tiger from Poznan. Poznan. And if I'm being fully honest, sorry, but I clicked on it by mistake. I meant to reject it because I wasn't that interested. It's a tiger tank, starters, and I'm not exactly that interested in them in World War II. I considered them kind of pointless. Uh, they, the, uh, my view on the tigers, to an extent, I can understand the panthers. But I think the Tigers, King Tigers, and all the other ones would have been better off spending those resources on churning out as many Panzer IVs as possible. And maybe upgunning and us upgrading the Panzer IVs a bit more. But... Nope. This is... This book has come to me. And so I read it, because starters, it's Richard, uh, written by Richard Sigurd, and it's translated by Magic Sajensi. And that made it interesting to me, because those are names I know. It's also interesting in that Poznan is one of those interesting battles. It's one of those less uh, studied in some respects. It's more studied in some ways, less studied in other ways of battles. And so, well, This is the young man we're talking about. This is Richard Siegert, who is Oberschutz Richard Siegert, um in training with, that's a picture when he's in the third company. And it's, it's about his experiences. And I read for it. And, A, I was impressed by the candor, and B, I found some of the stories in it really quite illuminating, because I study most of Tank War, and I, I, I do... As it's well known, I have an affinity for land ships. I do enjoy them. And I do like to study them. And I do like to study the history. And usually that involves me looking at, I must admit, Soviet and British tank history. I, I do read a fair amount of American, but it, American tank books seem to, in my experience, fall into two categories. Patton was amazing. Patton was terrible. Um, I sit there and go, he was probably somewhere in between, but he wasn't either of those extremes. Whereas the British tank uh, books tend to be slightly more mercurial when it comes to our leaders. And the Russian ones tend to be, well, mainly eulogizing the tanks rather than the actual commanders. Apart from Zukov. Zukov. Anyway. So. German book, books about German tank commanders, honestly, again, some of the times I find them just a little bit overblown for my taste. Anyway, chapter 11, at the Citadel. What was the situation at the Citadel? Over a hundred years old and our fortified headquarters at the time. The building was surrounded by brick walls covered on the outside of earth with an open square in the centre. Underground corridors connecting some of the buildings were filled with wounded. 
It's like an anthill. There wasn't an inch of free space on the ground for us to stretch our bones. Not only was it the main rendezvous point for the fighting units, but also a supply depot with a bakery and a kitchen on the lowest floors. The Citadel was under constant enemy fire as the Russians had realised long before how important it was. In a room with two windows looking out onto the square, I squeezed myself between the two soldiers who were laying on the floor like sardines in a tin. While many of the wounded tried to carry on fighting with what little strength they had left, I was hid in the basement. Nobody wanted to get hurt and die a slow death in a stronghold surrounded by Russians. Ammunition, food and medical supplies were delivered by air via, by air via parachute drops. I lay down on some straw to try and get some sleep. It was impossible in such a damp and stuffy room. There were a few Hindenburg lamps in the middle of the room, but not enough to provide any decent light. Rushing sewing machines constantly flew over the citadel, dropping bombs, encountering no resistance from anti-aircraft artillery. The Russians used spotlights to send signals to each other, and the brick walls trembled under the massive under the bombs as if they had a fever. A brief wailing was heard, from uh, followed by a massive explosion. Brick dust and smoke suffocated me. The other soldiers jumped up, scared, and started and started running towards the door, trying to get outside. Thankfully, I was laying by the wall, otherwise I would have been trampled to death. The artillery shell had hit right between the windows. The tiger was almost uh, almost a casualty of this attack as well. A series of volley fire from the Stalin's organs had reached it, and it was now on fire. Despite ongoing artillery, a brave tank man ran towards the vehicle and doused the flames with a fire extinguisher. Then he started the engine and drove out of the firing zone at full speed. Unfortunately, he couldn't operate the seven-speed gearbox and pushed the tank so much that he damaged the clutch. The tank was immobilized. Our best anti-tank weapon was now unable to be driven. The heroic tank man, Oberg Fischer, Fischer, was the very same one who'd helped me as a loader during the credit Zemstor mission, back when we defeated two Russian tanks. He proved himself to be a genuine Saxon. Sometime later, he proved his exceptional courage once again, and as a reward was promoted to Unter Officer. It happened after an aerial bomb had penetrated all four floors of the Redoubt's barracks and landed without exploding in a bakery full of Lanzas. As the panic soldiers started to flee, nearly trampling each other to death, Fisher calmly picked up the bomb and carried it outside. Luckily, the bomb didn't explode. It could have been a dud or a time bomb. There were still about 500 to 800 soldiers and lieutenants in the combat zone on the eastern bank of the water, as well as a large... Number of wounded on the Nivea factory. And the school for the deaf. By the 15th of February, they were packed into such a small area that their end of the end the following day was easily predictable. Only a few were able to break through to the citadel, as the final city bridge was already in enemy hands, and the railway bridge to the northeast of the cathedral being blown up. On the night of the 15th of 16th February, a long column of soldiers and wounded started their march after being granted permission by their commanders to break out of the eastern bridgehead. Approximately 800 to 1,200 men, led by Lieutenant Nook, former commander of the Armoured Shock Reserve, broke through somewhere in the northeast and northeast next to Fort Haight. Nook, obeying an order, had previously searched for the best place to breach. There was complete calm amongst the, among the Russian outposts. Without a word or even the slightest rustle, the column of ghosts made its way silently and secretly through the night in the snowy fields. It wasn't until next day that the Russians noticed the German positions in front of them were already empty. What had seemed impossible was now a fact. Around a thousand people had broken free from their death grip and through the Soviet circles surrounding Ponzan. But this was only the beginning of an act of despair. Having passed the Russians, the soldiers then split into smaller groups and tried to reach the German lines in Pomerania. Pomerania. Only a few hundred of them would make it. Meanwhile, back in Ponzan, the only ongoing fighting took place around the citadel. The majority of the resistance points in the city and the outside forts had been abandoned, while others had been cut off and left on their own. Fighting to the bitter end, Major General Gunnell broadcast the following radio telegram to Himmler. The enemy is systematically destroying house after house, and the outposts are then fired with, fl with flamethrowers by the infantry. The last entrance to the citadel was the north gate. With help from the Sturmgurch, my tiger was dragged through the gate and then well hidden at the edge of the nearby forest. Its task was to guard and keep the road enemy free. I could see the vast expanse of the Zeppelin meadow in front of me, and a huge hangar to the left. It's a great position for me. I had a free field of fire within a 180 degree radius, meaning the Russians were forced to pass through this open space. It all made me very happy. There was a house 30 meters ahead of the Tiger, and we occupied three quarters of it. Aside from Polish civilians, there was also a group of German infantrymen sheltering there. We occupied the second floor, from which we had a perfect vantage point. One of us constantly sat there, all the time watching the Roman the Russians movement. In case of an alarm, we only needed a few seconds to run through the trenches to reach the Tiger and climb on board. 
Our supplies had improved as well. We are closer to the source, and for the first time in four weeks, we had warm soup. It was delicious. However, I was still worried about my health. It was so cold in the tank at night, and my throat was so sore that I could hardly swallow anything. And on top of that, I also had a fever. I decided to try to find a doctor in Citadel, but my efforts were in vain. Bounds of wounded soldiers lay unattended on cramped bunkheads, mating and waiting for medical attention. Many of them didn't make it, and died from their wounds. The doctors were operating continuously, day and night, but were unable to keep up with the waves of wounded. It didn't take long for painkillers and bandages to run out. The atmosphere in those underground corridors was filled with screams and groans of the wounded. I left the Citadel almost in a hurry, resolving to search the neighboring houses for first aid kits. In a mansion that probably brought and belonged to some high-ranking member of the labor service, at least judging by the size of the library, library, I managed to find a medicine come in. I swallowed a handful of strep throat lozenges on the spot and took with me anything I thought might come in handy later. It's not a book I uh, would have asked for if I hadn't pressed the wrong button. But it's a book I'm glad to have read. It's given me another side. Another part of the equation to think about. I have to admit, I wasn't sure why I didn't pick this book. I wasn't going to pick this book. Just didn't interest. Well, didn't think I was interested in it. Tiger of Pon from Ponzan. I thought single tiger tank. Oh, great! No thanks. German naval books. I would have picked without even thinking and ordered. Um, but I'm not sure why. But as I read it, I was glad I read it. Would I buy it myself? That's always a tough one. Probably not, as I wouldn't have clicked on it. Because I did read the blurb. I just thought, no. But it's £20 in the UK. Well, technically it's nineteen ninety nine, but we all know that means £20. And $32.95 in the US, which means $33. If you want a first-hand account of this battle, or Pozan, Pozan, you couldn't go better. Uh, couldn't do really worse than this. It's a good book. Uh, it's a good book. No, you couldn't do better. You could do a lot worse. Sorry. But I have to admit, the other thing it convinced me was that tiger tank. It took so much effort to get it there. How much more use would have been the equivalent effort being focused on churning out as many fours as possible? Upgunned. Would they have been as good at destroying T-34s? Well, they certainly worked hard enough. In the end, it comes down to a story of a crew trying to fight for a cause which is their country. It might have been a country also already involved in something absolutely heinous. It might have been led by an atrocious individual. But there again, the nicest way the Allies had Stalin on their side. So um, 
as much as you'd like to you can't really chuck as many stones as, as you would like to in glass houses although that to be honest his is mostly sort of paranoia he doesn't go and pick on a particular ethnic group for it although this treatment of the cossacks is interesting so we'll leave that to one side that's a different philosophical debate But no. If you want an account of a tiger tank in World War Two, it's a good book. Tiger Tank of Panvan by Richard Seagert. Take care.